Thanks so much, Jim. Two seconds. I'm sure. Um, so I've been waiting for this event for quite some time. I'm really, really excited to introduce Karen to you. Um, I think you know that she has a PhD in anthropology writing about Gidra, the first Asian American national publication. I know there are many Gidra readers out there today, so um, that's what her dissertation is about, and she's uh, about, or will turn that into a book soon, so we can expect that. But uh, you also probably know she's the author not only of Serve the People, but uh, of Something Strong Within, which is about the role of home movies in both academic research and in uh, explaining our community's history. And the museum is very familiar with that because we've done several projects utilizing home movies and their significance to our community. She's also done the film Toya Miyatake, Infinite Shades of Grey, which was screened at Sundance. And so she's a, a award winning filmmaker. And you may not know that um, she was very instrumental in uh, what the Japanese American National Museum looks like today. And she was uh, its first senior curator and also a senior producer, and she was also the director of its media arts program. So she had a lot to do with the way Jana looks and feels today. Um, Karen's been a member of various organizations and boards. I wanted to point out that um, she was willing to sit on the National Film Preservation Board to speak up on our behalf and our meaning those underrepresented films that are still of significance to the American public. So it's things like that that we really need to thank Karen for. But you know, uh, aside from all of these um, recognitions and accolades that she's received, I think the thing that I wanted to say most today is that I've been working with Karen quite closely over the last year. We're putting together a retrospective of visual communication's first 20 years, and so hopefully we can bring that to San Jose at some point. But in working with her sometimes on a daily basis, I can really see that um, she has gone over and beyond really what most of us could do by just living life on a day-to-day -day basis. I've seen her in a role as mother, wife, grandmother, chief babysitter. Um, she's so lucky to have three grandkids, uh, that kind of thing. But I know it's the type of thing that she would rather do. But I think we really need to thank her for doing our histories, uh, making our stories legitimate. I know not all of you have read the book, but I think you'll um, really see that these personal histories have really, um, that Karen has put together these personal histories to really make up the history of our community. So please join me in welcoming Karen Shizuka to San Jose. Okay, wow. I can uh, have more than two, two sentences today? <laughs> okay, good, good. Anyway, I really want to thank uh, Dwayne and Tom Mizu for um, bringing me here today to organizing it and also to the Japanese American Museum of San Jose for hosting this. Um, you know, I know it's such an honor to be here at the San Jose um, <clears throat> J-Town because I know it's one of the three original Japanese towns, Nihonmachi is still, um, still around. and. I'm sure you think that it's the best. And actually, you know, before you know coming here, my son, other people said, "Oh, you're going to San Jose, you tell me that's so good. You, know, you should go here, you should go there." And um, you know, I think that you know for good reason. You know, the, you not only have the history, you know, like the Issei Hall that was um, built in what 19, 1910. Right, as the original uh, Japanese hospital, but you know, just to have it here, the uh, Buddhist temple that was done in I think 37. But you know, really, it's really the mostly the really hard work that it takes. You know, as um, many people have said, that you know, the, the Jams is now celebrating its 30th year, all on volunteer work. You know, that's really incredible you know having been part of the Japanese American National Museum and knowing how much it takes to keep something up um, on a daily basis uh, you guys are really really to be uh, congratulated you know and then later we'll hopefully all go to the new Aikai and um, you know that was actually started in the mid 70s 
by uh, students from San Jose State, and they were really part of this whole Asian American movement um, that you know I'm, I'm really going to talk about today. So you know it's really really an honor to be here. So I'm going to talk about um, yeah. That's it. I'm going to talk about you know basically why Asian American came to be, and then what the Asian American movement was, and then kind of leave with now what. So um, Jeff Chang um, wrote in the preface to my book that there was a time when the term Asian American was not merely a demographic category but a fight you are picking with the world. So this book that I wrote is really about that fight. Um, you know, now Asian Am Am Americans are the fastest growing uh, ethnic group in the United States, but, um, you know, and the term Asian American and even API has become, you know, very commonplace. Um, so now it, it actually is used more like an adjective, an ethnic identifier. And, but you know, until the Asian American movement of the late 60s or 70s um, into the late mid 70s, no one really thought of themselves as Asian Americans. You know, we're primarily, you know, Asians in this country were primarily Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Filipino Americans, and some Korean Americans. So we really thought of ourselves as those ethnic groups. But you know, from the mainstream point of view, we were, you know, very marginalized, we were very small, we didn't have a, a voice, and, you know, in the black and white, you know, sort of dichotomy that the, is really uh, the United States, um, Asians really did not have uh, a voice or, you know, much of, a, much of an identity beyond just being sort of cultural and sort of, um, you know, ethnic oddities. So you know, as separate groups, we're still very, um, very small. Uh, so and so, you know, it's like why did and how did Asian America then come to be? So you know, although you know, the U.S. has had a long history of racism, you know, most of it has been sort of black and white, and uh, Asians are, are often forgotten as having been targets of racism, both in the past and in the present. So you know, now, although we are relatively, you know, middle class, you know, established people um, in this country, you know, there was a time um, when we were sort of the bad, bad hombres and terrorists that you know other people are looking to uh, recent immigrants as. So you know, I just want to quickly go through just some of the um, three sort of major federal legislations against Asians. Um, you know, the first is the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And so this is the first and only time that an ethnic group was singled out for exclusion. Um, you know, and at the time, the Chinese population as a whole in the whole United States was very small. It was only like 35,000 uh, across the nation, and they're mostly on the West Coast. So here, you know, in San Jose, I think there's over a million people in San Jose. So, you know, this was based on just like a fraction of the people who were, you know, even in this, in this community. Um, yet, despite the small numbers, the trade unions, um, the media, you know, even um, literature, uh, Max Romer's, Sax Romer's popular Fu Manchu series, uh, they all decried a yellow peril that even though they're small now, they would soon overrun the U.S. So what began as kind of a regional rant against a small minority uh, quickly became federal legislation uh, with the Chinese Exclusion Act. So you see, you note this, you know, this was actually, you know, a fairly uh, sympathetic cartoon. Um, you know, the Chinese guy is sitting outside a wall, and you know, I thought that was really interesting in terms of the iconography now of Trump insisting on wanting to build a wall with Mexico. So it's actually a wall that the Chinese guy is sitting out of. Um, so this is uh, just the first sort of executive um, decree of a ban 
that we're so familiar now with with the with the Muslim ban. Um, you know, the second one was the Immigration Act of 1924, and that really affected us as Japanese Americans. Um, now, with the Chinese ban, the Japanese laborers were recruited as a source of cheap labor, and then, like the Chinese, we worked in primarily low lower status, lower paying jobs, and like the Chinese, we were now named as the Yellow Peril. So the, there is a series of discriminating acts that uh, finally culminated in the Immigration Act of 1924. And the, that act did basically two things. It stopped all the immigration of aliens ineligible for citizenship, which meant the Japanese, you know, most of, most of our, my grandparents, were considered aliens ineligible for citizenship. And then secondly, it codified the preferred immigration from not only Europe, but Northern and Western Europe. You know, and it, as it stated, you know, in, the, in that law, it actually states in order to preserve the ideal of American homogeneity. So basically from 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act until 1965 when the national quotas were repealed, there was a ban on Asian immigration to this country. So most of our relatives uh, who came in during that time came in illegally. Uh, my father-in-law um, came from Japan on a ship, uh, came to San Francisco, and he was made, he was made to pay $200 uh, to disembark so that um, if he if he jumped ship, he would lose that $200. So he proceeded to do just that. He jumped ship. He left his $200. Um, his brother, I think, drove up um, and met him. I don't know how, but then they drove they drove down to Los Angeles, and he um, he never became an American citizen. You know, although he had lived here, you know, since 19. The, uh, between the 1920s. So, you know, once again, you can see how familiar this headline looks. You know, you can easily substitute Muslims for Japanese, you know, in this headline. You know, then, of course, it's the incarceration of World War II. And um, as you all know, the, the U.S. was at war with Germany and Japan, but it was only Japanese that were rounded up wholesale and put into um, American concentration camps without due process. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, this, this is a photo of my grandfather that was um, taken before, before the war in the 1930s. So, you know, without even knowing him, um, everything about this photo says that he was a distinguished um, proud gentleman, you know, he has was a top hat, you know, his medals, he was in the Russo-Japanese War, um, the formal sitting. And then in one day, you know, after Pearl Harbor, this proud and distinguished gentleman really became in essence a common criminal. So here, you know, once again, in terms of the photograph, without even knowing anything about him, it says criminal, with the mugshot and the uh, fingerprints. Um, so, you know, as you all know, although many people, Americans, still don't know about the abrogation of our constitutional rights uh, that even occurred, um, we all know that, that generations of Americans of Japanese ancestry have continued to struggle with that memory and meaning. Um, so by the 1970, 80% of Japanese Americans, 50% of, of Chinese and Filipino Americans were born in the U.S. So we were in every state of the country. And this is a, um, a map that came from Ghidra. Uh, as as uh, Dwayne mentioned, uh, Ghidra was one of the first Asian American uh, movement newspapers, and, and Dwayne was one of the original uh, staff people that worked on that. Um, so, so, you know, you can see that the, the circles um, indicate where Asian Americans, well, Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos lived, and they did live in every state of the country. So, you know, some of us grew up very isolated um, in places like Appalachia and the South, 
Um, you know, others of us grew up, you know, pretty much insulated in ethnic enclaves, the J-Towns and Chinatowns and little Tokyos and Chinatowns. Um, but regardless, you know, as people of color, we were subordinated by the white um, dominance of uh, expediency. So, and also because we were neither white or black, we were also considered foreigners, aliens, not Americans. So I don't know, I think most of you, you know, I did as growing up, I, I always heard, well, where are you from? You know, or do you speak English? You know, and it was funny because my mother is an English teacher. So, you know, to be asked, you know, gee, you speak English, you know, was always just very, you know, odd to me. Um, so then by the late 60s, you know, during the Cultural Revolution that was happening around the world, uh, the context of our lives was really Im impacted by three primary dynamics that sort of pushed and pulled us from being considered Orientals uh, without a voice to the political identity of Asian Americans. So the fight really began in earnest during the Vietnam War. And it's no accident that the Asian American movement was born at the height of the Vietnam War. You know, in the book, I, I uh, quote Bruce Iwasaki, who wrote in Vitra, as baby boomers, we literally, we, were, we had literally grown up and come of age during the Vietnam War. So we were already defined by race. So it wasn't, you know, it was pretty natural for us to identify them with the people who looked like us you know, on television. Remember, you know, the Vietnam War was really the first war that was televised. And I think, you know, we saw so few Asians before that. And this is the first time that we had seen, seen so many Asians, uh, you know, on, public te on television. So I think, you know, many of us just sort of viscerally kind of um, identify with, with the Vietnamese. Um, this is the cover of the May 1972 issue of Hydra. And um, this was created by um, Alan Takemoto, and uh, it shows you know, a white officer ordering an Asian American soldier to kill that gook, you gook. So you know, the origin of the term gook, um, you know, when you look it up in the dictionary, it says of unknown origin. But people do know that, it's, that it really started with the US military. It was first used in reference to Filipino during the Philippine American War, and then during the Korean War, who referred to both North and South Koreans as well as the Chinese. So by the Vietnam War, who became a racial slur that generally and was really uncritically uh, associated with pers persons of Asian um, ethnicities with the enemy. So you know, even as this cartoon indicates that even American soldiers of Asian descent were considered gooks. So the Vietnam War was a really major factor in solidifying a political identity of Asian Americans. You know, the second dynamic that I don't have um, a, a visual on is really the Black Liberation Movement. And the uh, Black Liberation Movement replaced the goals of the Civil Rights Movement, um, goals of equal rights and opportunity with the goals of self-determination and empowerment. And during that time, the naming ourselves was a big part of the process of defining ourselves. So, you know, just as the term African American signified the shedding of the stereotypes and misconceptions that was connected to the term Negro, so Asian American really signified rejecting the stereotypes and misconceptions around the being, quote, Oriental. And the third dynamic was really a third world, uh, the concept of a third world, learning about people of color around the world, fighting for self-determination was symbolically really revolutionary, was eye-opening and empowering, because all this time we had been considered minorities. And then suddenly we realized that people of color were the majority you know, of the world. So for the first time, we were able to really think of ourselves in not such minority uh, terms. So, you know, we were pushed by a racist war against people who looked like us, and then pulled by the inspiration of the Black Liberation Movement and sort of the promise of a third world. So Asians, sort of the promise
promise of a third world. So Asians throughout the U.S. came together to create a home we never had, and we called it Asian America. So, you know, what was the Asian American movement? It was initially called Yellow Power, Yellow Power Movement. And I think this was after the Black Power Movement. You know, and one of the uh, first widely published manifestos on an Asian American consciousness was written by Larry Kubota and appeared in the first issue of Deidre in April 69. So he had written, Yellow Power is a call for Asian Americans to end the silence that has condemned us to suffer in this racist society and to unite with our black, brown, and red brothers of the third world for survival, self-determination, and the creation of a more humanistic society. So, you know, without a lot of verbiage, um, you know, in one sentence, he really kind of encapsulated the three basic tenets of the burgeoning Asian American movement. You know, one was to defy being orientalized, um, as he said, by in ending the silence that has condemned us to suffer in this racist society. Two was to promote third world um, solidarity. So from the very beginning, I think that the whole coalitions with um, African Americans, Mexican Americans, um, and later uh, Native Americans was always there. Uh, so it was very practical for survival and self-determination. And then very simply, you know, is to work for a more humanistic society. And I think that was for everyone. So, you know, this was, um, you know, probably just the beginnings of an Asian American movement that was not um, a monolithic entity, but really was constituted by many different spheres of activism, you know, most, most um, overlapping. So I'm just going to touch on three spheres uh, today. One was, you know, as Asian American studies and historical recovery. So, you know, Asian Americans were at the forefront of the Third World Liberation Strikes at Berkeley and at San Francisco State. Um, and the first group to unify under the banner of Asian American was the Asian American Political Alliance, APA, um, that was founded in 1968 at UC Berkeley. Although I did discover um, a group called Asian Coalition for Equality, ACE, in Seattle. And really, that was made up more of middle-aged, middle-class people. Many of them are professionals, dentists, uh, reverends, um, and uh, specifically of Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino um, ancestry who really rejected the term of Oriental and unbeknownst to them, they didn't realize that uh, there was an Asian American political alliance, uh, but they independently called themselves um, Asian Americans. So, you know, it was not just on campuses, but um, because all of us knew so little of about, about our history as Asian Americans in this country, historical recovery really became a major theme. Um, in the community as well. So this is a centerfold, once again, from um, Idra, and it's the, on the first pilgrimage to Manzanar that, that they, they had in December 1969. Uh, so this features um, photographs of different people who were there. Um, they were taken by Bob Nakamura, my husband, who was incarcerated there as a, as a boy. So, you know, at this time, really, in 69, you know, America's concentration camps really were very little known and uh, really sort of forgotten and forsaken by a general public. So this was really the first public commemoration of the camps in the country. There were some, a few books, uh, Roger Daniels' book, but this was the very first uh, public commemoration. And then from this, you know, there are many, many pilgrimages that have cropped up throughout the country that go on pretty much um, uh, yearly. You know, the second one was really what we call the Serve the People programs. You know, and the Panthers actually popularized the term Serve the People, but it really originated from Mao Zedong. And then Mao Zedong got it from a 1935 poet, um, uh, Lu Shen. So it has a, a very long uh, history. So. Many of the Asian American social services that exist today had their beginnings at this point. Um, UI Kai, as I mentioned, um, San Jose State students, um, 
you know, was really part of this whole effort to serve the people and to to serve people that have not been were not getting social services from the outside. You know, one of the primary issues that confronted Asian American communities throughout uh, was redevelopment. Um, through, throughout the country, Chinatowns, little Tokyos, Manila towns, you know, in addition to rural farm, farmlands in Hawaii, were all being eaten up by civic and corporate expansion. Uh, so in LA, there was a large fight to save the historic little Tokyo from redevelopment. And, you know, Tom and I were talking uh, before this about how, you know, I don't think San Jose ever went through a redevelopment. But you know, I now I know I know now that you know there are so many new places and new people coming in, and I think that it's really good for you all to be here and to, to, I think I'm, I'm sure it could be a tension between taking it into uh, gentrification and forgetting about the, the uh, mom and pop organizations or the old or um, the the the. Um, the Issei Hall, et cetera. But I think that, I think it's, it's really good that you're all so um, active. Uh, and I think that, you know, you'll be able to stave off, hopefully, a, a total gentrification of the, of your uh, J-Town, J-Town area. But in LA, you know, this is a political cartoon on a redevelopment in Little Tokyo. Um, and it makes obvious <coughs> reference to the dystopia of George Orwell's 1984. You know, it's even titled Little Tokyo 1984. Um, this was um, drawn by uh, David Monkawa. Uh, but yet, if you take a closer look, it's really kind of eerily prophetic. You know, there's futuristic monorails and gauche billboards, you know, hawking Japanese corporations. Um, and it looks like right out of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. You know, I know there's a new Blade Runner now, but you know, the original Blade Runner film had that as you know, very much their visual um, imagery. Uh, but that film really wouldn't be made until 1982, which is 11 years after David did this. And then you see not one but two planes. I don't know if you can see it here, but you can see not one but two planes crashing into two towers, you know, complete with bodies falling from skyscrapers. Um, you know, that, of course, the real life dystopia of September 11th, 2001. So, you know, I had actually asked David, you know, how did you, you know, how were you able to put this together? And, you know, those of you who know David and know the era will appreciate, he said, well, I don't know, I was stoned. <laughs> The arts of activism is kind of the third, uh, third sphere and, um, you know, created a new culture of both resistance and renaissance. Um, they were just not the means of representation, they were really the makers of meaning. So, you know, the most iconic art form of the 60s was the silkscreen poster. And this is from Bridge Magazine, which was out of Basement Workshop in New York. Um, and this was from their 10th anniversary in 1982 that was a retrospective poster art throughout the country. So it showcased 88 posters um, that had been created between the time of 1968 and 82. So you can see that the posters reflect most of the themes um, that were really relevant during the Asian American movement. There were political issues like the fight for Asian construction workers in New York City and the Art Hotel in San Francisco. Um, arts programs like the Asian American Film Festival and the film Chan is Missing, uh, cultural events like the Little Tokyo Co uh, Community Mochizuki, serve the people programs like the health fair and historical discovery like the exhibition of Angel Island. So the, the arts was a really important part of creating what we have now as an Asian American uh, culture and community. Um, now, one of the deadliest weapons in the arsenal of the arts of activ activism is the political cartoon. And this was done not by a professional artist like um, David and um, 
David and Alan, but by Mike Morase, who is on the cover of my book, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see um, a clip from from uh, the project that Dwayne referenced that he and I are working on. But you know, political cartoons really have the capacity to spar swiftly and deftly with issues um, by treating them with exaggeration, you know, irony and impropriety. So you know, these cartoons were in the first three issues of Ghidra, actually. And you know, instead of raging against stereotypes, they really undermined them uh, by making fun of them. So besides these two, there was one on Filipino stuff, and then actually a fourth on uh, Korean stereotypes as well. So you know, it's it's now now what? You know, the Asian American movement of the late '60s, you know, no longer exists, nor should it. Um, social movements were not meant to last. Uh, they need to respond to current issues. And the demographics of Asian Americans have changed drastically. Uh, in 1970, the Asian American population reflected the Immigration Act of 1965. So restrictions were lifted. Um, they lived in every state, but there were still only one million nationwide, which is just about 1% of the population. Uh, now, the Asian American API um, population is 19 million, you know, 5.6% of the population, over 600% larger than the 1965 Immigration Act. You know, and like I said, it's the fastest growing um, single ethnic group in the United States. So, you know, instead of just Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, and some Koreans, we have Hmong, uh, Cambodian, Cham, Pakistani, Indians, uh, Sri Lankan Samoans, Chamorans, you know, just a vast variety. You know, and then a much greater um, range in socioeconomic uh, status as well. So you know, it's important to sort of um, disaggregate, as they say, the data that, you know, some people say, well, Asians are all well-to-do um, and all have good educations, but certainly that's not all. You know, this this we are all now so diverse and so so complex that we often forget, and the media often forgets that there are you know very pockets of poverty and still um, uh, dis disadvantages that the Asian population still experiences. But you know, in the mid seventies. Um, the Asian American movement basically started to wind down with the end of the Vietnam War that had such a galvanizing effect on the, uh, on the movement. Uh, so learning about the U.S.'s duplicitous roles in the Vietnam War, um, Mi Lai came out, the massacres, the Pentagon Papers, followed by Watergate. Uh, it really resulted in a real devastating loss of confidence in the U.S. government, and really the nation was really demoralized. Um, you know, and now really history seems to be repeating itself. The similarities uh, between uh, post World War II, post 11, and now um, are really showing itself. So, you know, this was, of course, after World War II, um, no Japs wanted. Um, this is after 9-11, similar kind of graffiti. And this is, uh, this was just, this was just this last February, actually. Um, and it's interesting, because it says chinks, and this was in uh, Minnesota but it was really a Hmong family. Um, so it shows how we're still all kind of grouped together, lumped together, um, and um, I think really for the first time since the Vietnam War, you know, there is also a corresponding loss of confidence, you know, in, in democracy. Um, and, you know, there, there's been so many so many uh, references between the similarities between then and now. Um, I think at the women's movement, women's march in January, you know, one of the signs that I saw was that uh, if librarians are marching, you know things are bad. 
So, you know, I, it, it's, it's just not affecting, you know, just a certain groups now. You know, it, it really is affecting, you know, all of us. So, you know, one difference between then and now is now I, I don't see a pretense uh, to, of diplomacy or decency. Um, you know, I think there have also always been crazies in the world, and I think, you know, that's always an excuse. Oh, there's always racists, there's always crazy people. But, you know, now there seems to be a license to hate. You know, when the president of the U.S. can say the awful things that he says about women, um, Mexicans, minorities, etc., you know, it, it, it gives people license to, um, to, to come out of, of the woodwork and, and say the same. Um, you know, I was at a, I presented at an Asian American Psychological Association conference and we were talking about some of the current day um, impact of um, the administration just on people on a daily basis. And, you know, one of the people in the audience was an, uh, a young uh, Asian American therapist and she said, you know, the people, um, she had a patient who was raped, and for her, just the post-traumatic syndrome came out when Trump, you know, had that whole thing about, um, you know, what he said and what he can say against women, it really unsettled her on a very, you know, she didn't consider herself a very political person, but you know, she, she could just really feel that. So I think you know, it really is. It's you know, it's not just the radicals that have to speak up. It's the librarians and other people because I think it just affects all of us at this point. So um, you know, the one thing you know I'd like to end with is uh, well, before that, you know, at the. During the uh, during the redress movement, you know, a lot of us who were active in that um, really were fond of quoting Pastor Niemöller, um, who you know said that you know first they came for the communists, and I, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Um, then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Um, but then they came for me, and by that time there was no one left to speak up. Um, I think at this point, you know, there's uh, politically, I think we need, you know, more alliances uh, and allyships than ever before, you know, across generations, across ethnicities, across races, um, young and old, um, Muslims and Japanese, um, Asians for Black Lives Matter. Um, I think that there's the, the coalitions are, are really needed. Um, so really, you know, at this point, there's really no division I see between race, uh, generation, um, ethnicity. You know, it's really between those who remain silent in the face of injustice. Um, you know, and then personally, I think no one can afford, we can, all, we can all become activists in our own way. And that doesn't mean that we all have to go out and march or raise our voices. You know, we can be activists in, in many, many different ways of uh, writing, of voting, of supporting uh, organizations like this, of uh, joining with other organizations. Um, just by coming to places like this and educating ourselves about our, our uh, histories that were not told uh, is part of the whole resistance and effort for self-determination. Um, and then lastly, actually, I would like to end with um, uh, a lesson that Sansei Chris Ijima learned from his Nisei parents, Kazu and Tak Ijima, who were also activists. And he said, you know, my parents taught me that you can be an activist and a normal person at the same time. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Okay. So as I said, um, I get to ask Karen a few questions first, and then I'll open it up to you guys. And let me start with, um, so Karen, why is it important to document the Asian American movement and the Asian American communities? Okay, this will definitely take more than two sentences. <laughs> um, you know, I think as all of you know who have been active here at JAMS, um, you know, we need to preserve and pass down our legacy, our histories, uh, and we all stand upon the shoulders of those who went before us. You know, I think that our or our generation, you know, one reason that Asian American Studies was so important was that we had no idea, really, we had no idea of what came before us. And I think that um, once we did, we got a lot of strength we realize that we had a long history, that we do belong here. Uh, we've contributed to in, in many, many ways. Um, and I think, you know, now with the Asian American movement, you know, like we we're, were saying at, um, we were saying at breakfast this morning, you know, we Sanseis are now the Niseis, <laughs> if not the Niseis of this community, you know. And um, it, it really is true, I think that for good reason, there's been a lot of uh, impact and, and focus on camps. Um, but as you know, Brian Nia, who's a, a Sansei historian, always used to say, we're more than just the camp people. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that as, as important as that is, and as important as the um, 100th 442 and the resistors, um, were it, it is also important to um, document and preserve our own history because we are becoming history. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're almost history. Right? Uh, I'll, I'll get to you guys in a second, but I want to ask that same question in another way, which is. Why is it important to write books and PhD dissertations about our community? You know, as Wayne mentioned, I was active in film um, and uh, did a lot of films with my husband, Bob Nakamura. Uh, and, uh, you know, I sort of gravitated to the written word. Uh, because it's down in like concrete, <laughs> it's 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 um, it's something that can be cited. Um, people can um, assign it. Uh, people can use it. Uh, and to me, if, if it's not, it, in order to get into the canon of American history and culture, it's really through not only the whole culture, but books. You know, because. They can be cited, they can be passed down, um, and somehow books solidify a quote history. Um, it's not entertainment. Um, it's it's uh, and you know up to this time it's only been sort of the official history that's been written and in books. Uh, so if you still just learn about that, learn about history from those old books, you have no idea. Um, of the diverse history and legacy of the United States and specifically um, Asian Americans. Um, so I think that you know it really is um, important to have places like this um, and to really pass down not only to our own children and grandchildren, but you know to all of the state of California and and uh, and the U.S. So. You know, I think that, you know, um, your efforts have been, you know, I, I remember meeting Jimmy Yamanishi many, many years ago. Um, I, and I think that so many, uh, Dwayne mentioned that um, I was involved with uh, film preservation. And it was really Dave Tatsuno who was the first, uh, one of the first group uh, home movie makers. You know, and that really is one of my actually personal proudest things is being able to get his films into the National Film Registry. Mm -hmm. So that's really still to this day the only 
film on the registry that emanates from an ethnic minority community. It's a community-based um, um, sort of institution and uh, story. So um, I'll get to you, Wes. <laughs> so there are some, uh, I've read that the term Asian American is a social construct. And then there are those of us who feel like we live an Asian American lifestyle every day. Can you kind of talk about the parameters of both uh, the terms laid upon us and then those that we live every day ourselves? See, Dwayne just springs these things on me without any, you know, we've been talking, talking, talking all this time and he just <laughs> says to me these things. <laughs> So Asian American construct between the outside and the inside in terms of, yeah, yeah, real life. Okay, you know, the other thing is I think that, you know, Asian Americans are still, especially Japanese Americans, are still considered the model minority from the outside. I think people look at us and, uh, you know, we've been able to um, accomplish so much and do so much and then they, they look at, see, you guys went to camp peacefully, you know, you're such good, you know, minorities, um, you, you know, you fought during World War II, you know, even though we were considered cannon fodder and lost so much, uh, we had to prove, you know, our own loyalty, um, you know, so I think that's from the outside, you know, I think that now there are so many Asian Americans and you know there's so many especially here in the area in silicon valley that you know there's such a lot of class uh, a lot more upper class asians have come into um, the united states that i think there's a conception of sort of lumping you know i've heard you know asians are the new white people uh you know and there's always this sort of um dichotomy uh, sort of, oh, you guys are with those people and not as people of color. But, you know, I think those of us who have lived it and who have lived our community and life and have undergone, you know, the incarceration and the discrimination, uh, the class ceilings uh, not being, uh, being passed over for promotions, um, the redlining in not being able to to uh, buy houses in certain areas. You know, this is something that's, you know, very, very real. And I think that uh, it, it has been most of our, ex in, uh, most of our experience. Uh, so I think that, you know, it's just like, I think one of the choices that we had um, during sort of an Asian American movement is who do you identify with? You know, do you identify with sort of white people and sort of the, the oppressor, uh, the dominant society, uh, overly mobile, uh, or do you identify with people of color? So, you know, I think it's something that everybody has to come to on their own, and it's not often an easy, uh, easy decision. But, you know, I think that's sort of the dichotomy that I see between, you know, outside and right. Um, I think one of the coolest things about writing this book was the fact that Karen was able to talk with I think probably more than 120 people, some of the coolest people in the country actually, but what I wanted to get to was, so all of these activists who created the Asian American movement, and you got to talk to many of them, what kinds of things do they have in common? What traits do they have if there was a common trait? Or, you know, who were these people that you interviewed and created the Asian American movement? Yeah, I think, you know, with the Asian American movement, we never had, you know, leaders like uh, Martin Luther King or uh, a lot of the black um, black movements. Uh, it, it really bubbled up from the community. Um, and I think that there was um, just an, uh, uh, a wanting to do something. Um, it's interesting that you know many people ex had exhibited sort of leadership and outspoken qualities when they were younger. Um, I think like Dwayne, you were part of the student body, you know, as in high school. Yeah, in high school, um, there are a lot of people who had had spoken up, you know, fairly early in different ways, you know, of sort of not being uh, sort of afraid. 
Um, but you know, I think that the that it was such a, a broad variety of people. You know, I think uh, there are people, you know, like Duane and others who were really instrumental in starting Ghidra and other things. Um, but I think the the majority of the Asian American movement really came from the grunts. You know, most people like you and me who just set up the chairs and take took them down again, uh, showed up, uh, brought the refreshments, passed out the flyers. Uh, we were ones who never got arrested, never you know got well. Some of us got arrested. <laughs> But you know, most of us, you know, most of us were just just plain folk, and I think that you know, it just got to a point where you just were fed up, and you just didn't, you know, just didn't want it to to be silent anymore. And you know, I think once again, it has, you know, everybody has their their uh, their points where they where they, you know, they can take a lot or a little. Um, but you know, I think you know that's that's really you know one of the things that you know it just took a lot of different people. So there really wasn't any one or two or three kind of kind of traits that you know I think. Okay, and we will get to the question of what we have to do today, just like we did back in the seventies. But I want to ask Karen one more question, more of a personal one, but. So Karen, I read both in Serve the People, but also in previous publications that you acknowledge and um, honor uh, your New York City aunties, um, Yuriko Chiyama, Michi Weglin, uh, Kazuchima, um, Aiko Herzog. And I, I just wanted to know, so what were some of the lessons that they passed on to you? And I want to just show that this is a continuity. It really didn't just start with the Asian American movement, but these new say women, I think, were very instrumental in some of your thinking as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, I, I write in the book that you know I went to New York for the first time in 1970, I think, and that's when I met um, all these women who were, um, you know, really became sort of my. Um, I always called them my New York Onesans. Um, they were always uh, people. You know, and one of them is Kazu Ijima that Chris and, and to your kid that you don't always have to have sort of the upper hand that you know you do have things that you disagree with that you can really talk to with. Um, so you know now I think you know an, a, another thing that I'm really proud of is you know my son Tad is you know working along with Dwayne and, and Eddie Wong. I think Eddie is still here. He came in for a little while. Yeah. Uh, on this whole uh, project with uh, visual communications, and you know, he did a film called Pilgrimage, uh, which is on the first um, a pilgrimage to Manzanar in '69. But you know, it, he did it in a way that he did it for young people. So it was not just telling about the camps, not necessarily, but really about our generation who discovered the camps. So you know, it, it, and he did it with a real hip hop um, music track. Uh, he included what was happening today, and so I think you were we're always needing sort of those those uh, people who can bridge um, the generations and sort of reinterpret you know our histories for younger people and make them you know come alive. Great, and I uh, just have one last question. <laughs> and that was, <laughs> Sorry, but it's the question that we're all going to ask, which is, so given the Asian American movement, what lessons did we learn for today? And Karen start, answered part of that, and we hope to get more out of many of you because we want to talk about this later at UICI, but let me ask Karen that question directly. What lessons did we learn from the Asian American movement? Yeah, well, as I, you know, as I mentioned, the Asian American movement no longer exists, and it shouldn't. You know, I mean, people, this, the, the reason to, to have done this book or to do these talks is not to resurrect the past, but really to, to, to help, you know, sort of enlighten what happened and for us all to take different lessons uh, from it. Um, you know, I think different people have different lessons. You know, one thing that just, told, you know, comes to my mind right now which you know, I didn't write. I did write about it in the book, but I was reminded of, uh, about it by 
uh, a person who wrote to me and who wrote um, it that she really liked the book, then she really learned a lot. And, you know, it was she was one of the people who was really put off by some of the rhetoric and some of the um, stridency, you know, of people during during the time. And, you know, she was so put off because she just felt that it, everyone was just, you, you know, either had to be really radical or not at all. And, uh, and I, I did. I ran into a lot of people who um, uh, felt this way um, and a lot of a, a lot of the leaders, you know, as well, who had indicated this, that, you know, this is one thing that they did wrong, that was wrong. Um, you know, I think we need to all think about, you know, our young people too, of how uh, things are very, very passionate at that time when you're very young. Uh, this was such a new thing that a lot of people were, were you know, very, very uh, strident. Um, and I think, you know, that's one thing that, uh, that I think we can't afford to do now. We just cannot afford to alienate, you know, to, to anybody. Uh, I, I really think that the situation now is such that we all have to, you know, find that commonality is, and although we do have differences and we do have, you know, different communities have different issues and different priorities, um, but, you know, I think that, you know, we are at a point where we, we really are united by sort of, you know, this, this whole despondency and, you know, really a lack of confidence in, in our government and therefore uh, a higher reliance on, on each other. Great. Thank you very much. So um, I'll open up the questions with Wes Mugliana. And by the way, I think the room is small enough, so if you stand up and project, we don't need to pass a mic around. Wes? <laughs> well, I confess I haven't read your book, but uh, it seems so California-centric. Uh, uh, and I know you're speaking to California, but I come from the Midwest, and we had the Asian Liberation Organization. I don't know if you, you recorded that we had. We had publications like Pizza, uh, people like Bill Horry, and uh, Grace Lee Ball. Quite a few leaders within Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, all those uh, <coughs> Midwest states. And I think uh, it's an injustice if you don't really recognize the movement that happened here in the time. March on Washington, Grace Lee said, <laughs> I like to hear. I like to hear about. That wasn't a common <laughs> I like to hear about. You know, it seems to be New York and, and California. So I thought maybe you do have that in your book. I don't know. No, you're right. And you know, it, it started out. You know, being. Uh, it started out being a book on Vietnam because my funding was so small. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. I didn't have the funds or the means to go anywhere. Um, and I did get a grant. And, uh, but, you know, like you said, there's so many things that were happening in so many different places that, you know, I hope that this book is just the beginning of people like you writing your own stories. Because I think that's where the real, you know, the real truth of the matter comes out. Um, I had originally suggested a book on Ghidra to my publisher, Verso, um, and they, they liked what they read in my, uh, in my proposal, but they thought that it was time for a book on the Asian American movement as a whole. And um, there have been a couple of books before. But they, it's been a long time, and some people were not very pleased with what had happened. So, uh, you know, I explained that, you know, it was very difficult to do a book on Asian, and I had no intention of doing, really, a book on the Asian American movement. Um, one reason is just what you're saying, is that there are so many important places, um, and that I could not possibly cover all of them. Um, you know, just by time and budget, 
Uh, so when they, the publisher really wanted something on a national basis, you know, I chose the obvious. It was just going to be the East Coast and the West Coast, mm -hmm. which, you know, just realistically was where most Asians were and where most of the activity happened. Um, I included uh, Seattle because I think that uh, it was something that when I found ACE, the Asian Coalition for Equality, and how early that they had formed in 68, um, and they were formed by middle-aged, middle-class people who actually really did a lot, like my New York one that sounds, to politicize the younger people. Uh, I decided to go ahead and, and um, you know, and really, it's, it's sort of on my own dime, went up to Seattle. And then I wanted to include Hawaii, mainly because, you know, Hawaii never gets included with anything with APIs. Um, and but also, you know, for good reason is that their story is so different, and you know, really do them an injustice, you know, by trying to integrate them. But um, so I, you know, tried to make it clear that uh, that this was, you know, very it was a very different story. Um, but no, you're right. I think that there's so many stories and so many organizations. You know, I did not include San Jose. Um, Stockton, there was a lot happening. Uh, you know, there's just a lot happening all over. Certainly the Midwest, uh, Boston, I didn't get to. Uh, there were places, you know, even in the South, uh, where very, very interesting and very important things were happening. You know, certainly Hawaii is a whole story in itself. But, you know, I think too that, you know, if you realize how many books are there on the Civil War, I mean, gazillions of books on the Civil War, you know, and how many do we have sort of on the Asian American movement? You know, very, very few. So it's very easy to feel left out of the very few that are, 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 are out there because, you know, there's such a great story to be told. So, you know, one of the things I do say in the book is that hopefully this really inspires and um, agitates people to say, well, why, you know, where's my story? So, you know, and to get that story out, I don't think, you know, you should rely on, you know, other people to tell your stories. There's so much, and I think there are, you know, some great books uh, written here on the San Jose Japanese American community, you know, and there's some great books written on Grace Lee Boggs, um, you know, Bill Horry, there's just so many people in the Midwest um, and all over. So I really encourage you to, go back to, you know, where where your own roots are and to, if there's not anything there, you know, try to get people to write. And I think, you know, that gets back to, you know, Dwayne's question of, you know, why, why write? You know, I think it really does, it's the only way to get into the canon of uh, American history and culture. Question? Yeah. Go ahead. I agree with you in all the statements you made because your advances, if you did an example of street artists, was one spirit to the blue sky, another one is where the Hawaiian is destined, and the other one is on the field of the standard. So you made responses. So all the grandkids are hot cups. So they will lose a lot because they're already mixed. And they get the perspective already from one half, but because our perspective is there isn't that much out there, and within within activism in a sense, but not as active as other, I think other ethnic groups, that it is important for their own self to stop this 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 who they are. And it really came out because one of my granddaughters came home from school and she was in tears because her best friend was a son. And her parents were getting to the boy back home. So it was a clear thing that they made things. And then she really made me to understand that this is our society in our world now. And we can't leave it as it is. So we need to have them all uh, be able to, you know, and it's up to us, well, it's up to the younger generation, you know, uh, to, 
Thank you so much. I'm from out of town, so it's a great honor to be here just today as you are here. Thank you very much. I wondered, with the census being done every 10 years, was there any linkage with Asian Americans trying to redefine the categories? You know, because it's such an important political definition of America, and I know the 2020 census there's a lot of problems with the people who are against the disaggregation of data. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to understand that. But during the 70s and 80s census, was, was there any movement among Asian Americans to you know, have a better category? Or was there any politicization of the census? Yeah, yeah. Did you all hear that about the census? And I think you know that's something that you know I didn't realize either, is how important the census is. You know, I think we just, you know, kind of kind of take it for granted. But um, the question was, you know, during the, the Asian American movement, was there any politicization in terms of the census? And um, yeah, uh, the, the most stories I heard was were in from New York, where uh, people in uh, living in Chinatown, you know, there are so many uh, paper sons and uh, illegal people um, that the census did not really reflect the true numbers that were in Chinatown specifically. So, you know, th there are young Chinese Americans who volunteered, and especially those who had some language capability, to go, th go in. And, you know, they themselves realized that, you know, there were, there were you know, the Chinatowns, there, there were like facades. So after this facade of this building, there was actually maybe one or two more in the back where people lived or that never had sort of an access, you know, public access. And this is where, you know, they all the the, the relatives from from China who weren't supposed to be here. So it was, yeah, it was really something. Um, uh, because they, I didn't realize that, uh, that that's what that's what services are based on uh, so much. Yeah, so much. And uh, if you don't get counted, um, but you know, then it's like you know your your grandchild's friend. You know, there's you know the immigration is such an such a force too that you know sometimes you can't be you know uh, counted, uh, so to speak. So you know, I'm sure that's still going on today. You know. There was some efforts in the 90s um, from California. I know that Chinese were affirmative action in San Francisco and Aki locally. There was a, a lot of concerted effort to get people in Washington that were Asian American, people of color, to affect the census and how they were taken in the different categories. So there was a big movement in the 90s, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's a movement now or if there's any focus on it now, but I know there was for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. Is else? Anybody on that question? Well, in the 60s, we were considered other. Yeah, that's what. That's right. <laughs> okay, let me just go on. Jackie, question? Um, no, Asian Americans for Advancing Justice, D.C. is supposed to be working on that issue because at least for um, Japanese Americans, you know, people are multiracial, so then how do you um, identify those folks and still count them as, you know, Japanese American or Asian American? And just to let you all know, the census coming up again, but they use those numbers to allocate millions, billions of dollars in federal taxes based on the census. They also draw political boundaries based on the census. So it's really critical for everyone to be counted, including people who are undocumented. Thank you. That's Jackie Marahashi from the Asian Law Alliance. Question? Professor Michael Omi at DC Berkeley did was on terrorism and did research in, in reporting about and that, that information went back, went back to the uh, Census Bureau. So, I, and so he's, he's been on different panels 
for committees to give some of that Okay, other questions for Karen? Yeah, Moss? Yeah, um, I'm really glad you were able to come up and do this event and glad that I came. Uh, one of the things from reading the book that I was glad to see also was mention of different Asian American socialist groups, including Ewart Kuhn or IWK, of which I was a former member. But what I didn't see, and I apologize if I missed it in your book, because I could have, um, was any mention of the East Wind Collective, which to me was a very influential local socialist group in Los Angeles. And I'd just like if you'd like to say anything about their role in the movement. I appreciate it. There were a lot of groups, you know, and there there was a group called the Garbage Men. That was a really early group that predated um, predated East Wind and uh, IWK and so many people. Um, East Wind, I think, was a little later. Was that uh, more 80s? Early 70s? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's one thing um, is that whole, uh, I, you know, you know Kazu Ijima, who, you know, was, was very much involved uh, in Asian Americans for Action, and a lot of people, uh, younger people, split off from Asian Americans for Action to form IWK. Um, and she always felt that there should be a coming together, that everybody should come together and, and uh, sort of air their differences. Um, I think that that's an, another, it's, you know, it's like the history of the Midwest. I think that that's another thing. And I think, um, I think uh, Eddie was saying that there's some, uh, you're putting together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, maybe Eddie, you can talk about what you're doing with, you know, that organization. But, you know, there's so much, you know, and that's definitely one of the areas. Um, the whole left uh, organizations and um, their, uh, their histories, their contributions. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's really, really important. But Eddie, you want to mention about that? Uh, oh, well, what we're talking about is um, a group of us are working on a finished the uh, first draft of the website, and it's based on the Unity newspaper, which was a newspaper of the League of Revolutionary Struggle, which was a Marxist Leninist organization. And East Wind Collective is one of the collectives that joined uh, along with uh, the August 29th movement, uh, the Revolutionary Communist Party, and Mary Baracus group in New Jersey, and formed the League. And so there's going to be a website, actually, if you look at it now, it's www.unityarchives.com project.org and it has many of the publications that um, that Unity newspapers put out including East Wind Magazine, the Black Nation and it's another slice of kind of like 80s to 90s uh, new communist movement and so many of us were part of that and there are many other groups who were part of that whole movement too there was a lot of disagreement and I hope that you know a lot of us are now finding each other at PTA meetings <laughs> and like recognizing that we have a lot in common. And so that's kind of, that's a whole other story. Right? So check out the website. Yeah, I think there are so many stories, you know, that being one of them, besides the geographical and these uh, political, political divisions and um, there's so much on the arts that haven't been talked about so much in so many different areas. So I think there's a lot for, for all of us to, to do and to look forward to. Susan. I was just going to say that I really like the, the thing about uh, activists being normal people. And um, there, there are a lot of normal people uh, today, as you know, who are uh, trying to figure out how to respond to some of these attacks on different people in our um, country, uh, like immigrants, um, like black people, like Asian Americans. And one thing I've noticed is that uh, I think as a Japanese American, uh, people are trying to cite the incarceration as some kind of a policy that model. So there are a lot of Japanese Americans who are normal people who are uh, responding to that. And a lot of people are coming together under um, something called Nikkei Resistors. So if you're interested, please come, please come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> So we have many 
early San Jose activists in the crowd today. So what was going on in the early 70s? Those of you who, uh, you know who you are. <laughs> Asians for Community Action, seminal group in this community, really with the ideas for many continuing institutions today, as Karen mentioned, uh, UI Kai, San Jose Taiko, Fuji Towers, just a lot of good ideas coming out of that period. John? Yeah, well, there's an important Asian American folk music group called Yokohama, California. Which is really <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of somebody here that, uh, you know, that's in that ensemble here. Like <laughs> what a great question. And, and you know who happens to be sitting in the third row here? Wait, you're cute. <laughs> So if you don't know, Peter, I think, is going to share some playing uh, and music later and then talk about the San Jose experience. So. I'll have some CDs. Uh, the proceeds today will go into either the Jam SJ or UI. Great, thank you so much. Yes? Yeah, what was the name of that YouTube channel that you mentioned at the beginning? He has considered himself, and other people actually have considered himself, considered him an honorary member of the Filipino American community. He married a Filipino American. Um, his friends are, you know, very, very diverse. Uh, and I think, you know, we grew up in, he grew up in Culver City. Uh, and I think that depending on where you grow up too, but, you know, he very much identified as just being uh, very multicultural to begin with, which I don't think I did, certainly. You know, I, I grew up in primarily a white neighborhood of, of Santa Monica, so, you know, I very much felt that I was, you know, sort of alone, so there's blacks and whites and then there was me, you know, so it was like, um, so I think, you know, we really gravitated toward each other. I think, you know, too, I think, you know, just learning from my son and other people his age, you know, there is a sense of, you know, that's what they do most of their work is with their, within their own communities, ethnic communities. So, you know, I think although he would identify with being uh, broadly API, you know, most of his work has been done with the Japanese American community. And I think he himself <coughs> would consider himself Japanese American. And I think too that, you know, with, with us, we had such a third world, you know, I think sort of identity and wanting to share. And I think this, this generation is really um, very cognizant of cultural appropriation. You know, so I think that they are, they realize how much other people have culturally appropriated hip hop and other things, uh, Asian tattoos for one thing, everybody has an Asian tattoo. Um, so I think they're very sensitive, you know, to that too and not wanting to, to sort of um, own or, you know, sort of speak for other, other people. You know, he, he's done a lot of work with the Native Hawaiian uh, uh, people now, his, his latest film, Melon Murals, uh, is on um, two hip hop, uh, two uh, graffiti artists in Hawaii. Um, but he has been, you know, very much considers himself an outsider, you know, and as a guest, and um, has been very much accepted, but I think that he really understands and, and thinks of himself, you know, primarily as Japanese American too, because he doesn't want to you know, think that he has an understanding of their community as they do. Okay, um, let's thank Karen Shizuka for coming up.
Um, Karen is going to stick around for about a half an hour to sign books, but we all want to move over to the UI Chi by 3 o'clock. And just as we end, I think Jim wants to say a few words. Well, I was going to say, um, Peter's question kind of reminded me of a little story about uh, when uh, two ESA meet each other, they usually ask, you know, what can are you from? And then when two Nisei meet each other, they usually ask, you know, what camp did you go to? <laughs> and when two Sansei meet, they ask, you know, what college did you go to? You know, Cal, Stanford. <laughs> when two Yonsei meet, they say, are you Japanese? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so true. Uh, so I just want to thank Dwayne and Tom Izu, Steve Fujita, um, Chris Yoki, the crew that put this all together. And um, we will be selling books here uh, for a little while. Uh, we'll also be selling if there's any left, there's a limited supply, so if there's any left over that we put, they, you can purchase them at the UI Kai. Um, if you are not going on to the reception, you're welcome to tour the museum. The museum is open until 4 o'clock.